Good evening, everybody, and welcome to everyone who has joined us for tonight's webinar, and also to our viewers who will be watching this later on. MHPN, or the Mental Health Professionals Network, would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands, seas, and waterways across Australia, upon which our webinar presenters and our participants are joining us tonight. We wish to pay our respects to elders past, present and future for the memories, traditions, cultures and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. I'm Dr Nicole Hall, I'm a GP in Sydney and I will be facilitating our webinar tonight. Now, I'd love to introduce our fantastic panellists to you. You have already received their bios, but we have Tim, Matthew and Marie. So first, I'd like to introduce Tim, who's a GP in Melbourne, I think. So Tim, how common is school refusal in your practice as a GP? It's been very common, Nicole, and also it follows quite a bell curve. I, um, I see everything in my practice from uh, kindergarten students struggling to adapt to that transition all the way through to grade 12 students seeking a medical exemption from their examinations. But the vast majority of my presentations are clustered around late primary school, early high school ages. Oh, something I hopefully won't have to deal with with my kids. Uh, Matthew, as a rural practitioner, you see something different in kids who refuse to go to school than perhaps we in the city might see. Yeah, so we see a number of barriers with issues such as transport, but also a lot of issues around intergenerational trauma and a lack of access to regional or rural services to support young people. So that ends up being a huge barrier in a number of areas that you then conglomerates. And then we just get this really difficult presentation that is really hard to support when we've got lack of resources. And uh, Marie, can you please tell us about what new areas of research your team of psychologists are currently exploring in terms of developing tools to help in this difficult area for families and for parents? Sure, we're um, we we have been working on um, increasing the reach of our program, so um, including working with existing health services like Headspace National to um, let parents access our programs through their, their website. Um, we've also been working to um, develop some um, newer versions or adaptations of our programs to address additional needs like um, um, children with um, trauma exposure, um, as well as children with um, autism, um, to better support their parents to support their child's mental health in the context of these um, specialized needs. Um, and in addition to that, we, we're also working with different cultural um, groups, both locally with immigrant populations, as well as internationally to see how our programs could be uh, cross-culturally adapted to, to better suit their needs too. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit more about that during your talk. So next, we'll move on to talking about the instructions for the web player so you are able to get the most out of this webinar tonight. So to interact with the webinar platform and to access resources, there are a few buttons. The first, the View Supporting Resources button under the video panel has the slides, the resources and a survey about tonight. There is a chat area in the top right. Um, to open the audience chat box. And if you need any technical support, you can probably see on your screen in the top right hand corner, a tech support button. If this webinar stops working at any time, just refresh your browser. If you miss anything, there will be a recording of this made available to you later on. A few little rules because we're gonna have a lot of questions and answers I suspect tonight. Please be respectful of other participants and of the panelists and please keep comments on topic because we have such a huge number of questions already registered we won't be able to address very specific individual patient scenarios okay so now we're going to move on to our panelists giving their chat their talk and then we'll move on to our question and answer panel now, just to move on to the learning outcomes, I'm not going to read them out. I'm sure you can all read them yourself. So let's move on to the good stuff. First up, 
Themen. Thanks so much, Nicole. So if we begin with my first slide, one of the wonderful things I was taught as I was training as a GP down here in Tasmania um, is that anyone who enters one of our consult rooms fits into one of three groups. They're either a prisoner, they're there because someone else wants them to be there, they don't particularly want to be there. They're a visitor, you know, they're trying you on, exploring whether you can have a therapeutic relationship. Or they're a patient or a client, someone with whom you're well established and you're working towards some common goals. One of the wise things I heard was that at any consultation, you can only move someone one space along that spectrum. And so I take a pride when these sort of presentations come to me in trying to make an environment that that young person and that family feel safe to be in and want to keep coming back to. Is that lovely Walt Whitman quote of be curious, not judgmental, investing in trying to find out as much as you can about the lived experience of what's going on for the people you're interacting with uh, will be the solid foundation for which, as a GP, you can continue to make good progress. The next slide, please. So if we look at the case of Carleen, my first initial reflection is that there's plenty of people in that case who aren't currently in the room with me. And finding out about them as part of that initial contact, knowing how they all interact and knowing how they communicate is, again, just giving me information that's going to help me know how to help support this family. And the last people that aren't in the room are the school themselves. Whenever we talk about um, behaviours involving school, we need to acknowledge that there's a whole environment that as health practitioners, we tend not to occupy. And being able to get in touch with that is really important. Next slide, please. So there are lots of potential directions an initial consultation could take, but one of the areas I really love to start with is just looking at mornings, because they really do set the tone for the day. And looking at potential enablers and barriers of what could help Carleen and her family make a positive start to the day one of the early things we can do to start to change the narrative of what's going on around school. And I also love to engage with the teacher early on. I just send a brief intro email introducing myself, uh, introducing the situation as I understand it, welcoming their input and offering to collaborate about how we can be child-centred in our approach. So next slide, please. If we move on to the case of Hong, uh, one of the things that first strikes me is that I shouldn't necessarily be making any assumptions about whether there's any cultural overlays. But again, I need to have that curiosity and willingness to understand. But the other main area that stands out to me about that case is we've got physical symptoms. We've got potential functional or somatic symptoms. And I find it's both really important as a GP to be able to get to that point of discussing them, not avoiding it, but also to get through that point of realising that they're just a symptom of what's going on in that child's experience. And so we, we walk a narrow path between those areas. Uh, and we need to filter that a bit through what Hong's past school experience has been like. That's um, an area of uncertainty I have reading the case that I want to explore. So... If I move to my final slide, I think one of the things that's really important as a GP is that we need to be confident in approaching um, patients who present with pain or other physical symptoms, and we need to be able to shape that discussion in a way that's positive and non-stigmatising. One of the really nice frameworks I use to discuss with patients like Hong and families is that we can look at and explore both internal and external causes for physical symptoms. And we need to be able to make a shared decision with Hong and their family about what level of medical confidence is required for us to be able to settle that these are truly functional symptoms and that we can embrace working on supporting them collaboratively. And hopefully using all of that, we can uh, scaffold that into creating some shared goals and starting to already set a bit of a therapeutic path forwards. 
So that's my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tim. Okay, we'll move on to Matthew to specifically give us some perspective on how things work in the rural side of the side of medicine. Excellent. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so I'm just going to start diving into this. The first thing I'm going to be looking to do with Hong is looking at getting a full picture, and this is going to be a full biopsychosocial, cult cultural, spiritual assessment, which is really designed to work with Hong, but also bringing his family in. And what I'm doing every point of this process is I'm starting to paint a picture of how Hong has got to this point, but also other factors along the way that have been contributing, and not just for himself, but also for his parents, things that might be going on in the social environment. I also want to be looking at culture. I want to be very sensitive around that and doing this in a culturally sensitive but yet supportive way. And that's going to be so imperative why we need to bring the parents in. So I'm very big in the work I do. It's both parent and child-centred. It needs to encompass the whole system, but it needs to encompass this bigger macro system, including the school and the other staff. So this comprehensive assessment starts my building blocks to really work at looking at where I need to go from there. So if we go to the next slide, please. Largely what I'm going to be doing when I'm doing this is really spending some time with Hong to build some rapport and really understanding from his perspective or their perspective what has been going on. And if you sort of consider this lining yourself up, sitting alongside the client, looking at the problem from the same perspective as them, really trying to step into their shoes and we can then look at this as what we call empathic validation, which is the ability to connect to the internal experience, but the state this leaves them in. So an example might be being bullied or not feeling um, connected to other people is you feel alone, but you also don't feel heard or you don't maybe feel you're valued. So I'm really trying to connect to those deeper experiences to also then understand what makes it hard to potentially help seek as well. Is there a cultural aspect I need to be aware of? Is there something in that avoidance pattern and environmental factors here as well? Transport is so vital. Looking at what's happening in the playground and where, where things could be going wrong or where we might be able to intervene, even in the home as well. Can we go to the next slide, please? So... I think this is where you would then look to work and bring in the school, but then any other services that would potentially need to be appropriate, um, as well as working with the family to understand their dynamics, potential cultural dynamics, the way they parent, other expectations on Hong. Also, though, we need to consider is Hong sensitive to his environment and other people as well, because the targeting from the teacher, that does make me curious what that perspective is on both sides. Again, working with a school, bringing the teacher in. Um, getting consent is going to be a huge thing here as well. And I think that's vital to keep in mind. That's why we work with a family from the outset. Um, looking at culture as well, looking at other potential support services or health services that could be a bridge between looking at what we call biculturation, which is between one culture and another, and young people today potentially being stuck between them and being lost in self-identity. Can we go to the next slide, please? So then what? I want to stay engaged as long as I can until I know Hong and the family are connected to where they need to be. So that's going to potentially include therapeutic support, but also case management as well as systemically working with those supports. Um, it's also supporting Hong to develop a better sense of self-identity and what we might call reflective functioning, which is a capacity to understand our own states and communicate these with others and understand what drives us to avoid things. I'm also going to try and do the same with Hong's parents, though, through reflective parenting. These are both attachment-focused interventions to attune them better to Hong's needs, but I need to be very sensitive about what those needs are to, fit with, to really not sever the therapy relationship and to continue that going. Um, and I'm going to continually regular, continue to review the goals regularly and also look at things like the scoring systems. Are, are we getting outcomes? Are the scoring systems culturally appropriate? And also, are we achieving or are there roadblocks that we need to reassess and reformulate? Next slide, please. 
Okay, and that's me done. Thank you. Thank you so much. And before we get into the question and answer session, Marie, very much looking forward to hearing your perspective as a psychologist. So with the, the work that we do, we, um, we see fundamentally parents as key partners to work with and empower not problems to solve or overcome. So whether that's in the context of um, children, young people with mental health challenges or with school refusal or school attendance difficulties specifically in this instance. So in that context, um, the, the research is um, clear that when, when it comes to school attendance difficulties, there's a whole range of different factors that could be at play. Um, and the, the picture would be quite different for each child. Um, so it's really important to work with the child and the family to try to get as complete a picture as possible as to what underlies that particular child's school attendance difficulties. Um, and what the literature has um, has recommended is that, you know, they, as, as a practitioner working with these families, that you would look at, you would consider what is at the student or child level, what's at the family level, and then, of course, the school context and broader community or social cultural um, level as well. Um, in terms of the approach, we, you know, we would definitely be um, recommending um, maintaining curiosity, um, you know, in part because of, you know, the, the fact that it's really quite unique, a picture for every single child. Um, but the empathy to, to bring into the room with you is, is also really central because um, we know how much um, uh, school attendance difficulties impacts not just the child themselves, but also the family, um, especially if it's a problem that has been ongoing, um, uh, whether that's been brewing in the background and then surfaces in terms of actual absence from school um, or it's absence that has been going on for a bit of time. So, so just keeping that in mind is really important. Um, and then um, Ultimately, um, we want to be looking at um, identifying with the child and their family what is the child's school or education engagement goals. So, so in some instances, when um, completing that picture to understand what's underlying the school refusal um, or school attendance difficulties, um, it might become apparent that the current school um, that the child is enrolled in or the current school system um, might not be the best match to the child's needs and, and learning approach. Um, so so, so identifying alternative ways to re-engage the child in their education could actually be the goal that the child would, would want to work towards. So working with the family towards that goal is, is really important as well. Next slide, please. So looking specifically at Colleen um, as, as a case um, study to, to apply these principles, um, one thing that I would do is to really um, work with her to explore um, the fear that she has about leaving her mom alone all day. So, you know, what, what is that all about, you know, from her own perspective? Is this something that she has actually opened up and shared with any other supportive adult um, around her, whether that's mom or, or anyone else? Um, so, you know, in direct, in, directly in this context, is mom herself aware that, um, that she is the underlying reason um, for Colleen in this, in this instance not going to school? Um, and, and then importantly, um, you know, to, to not just looking at the, not, not just look at the, the deficits or the challenges, but also look for strengths and protective factors within Colleen herself. You know, are there certain strengths that we could leverage? Are there certain interests or um, protective factors at school, um, relationships within the home, um, you know, um, uh, her, her own interests or, or goals in, in terms of schooling or with her friends and, and other co-curricular activities at school, for example, um, that we could actually use as um, motivations for her to consider re-engaging in school. Um, when we look at the family level, um, of course, in the context of grief um, with this family to also think about how mom herself and all um, and dad and, and her older sister, how have they coped with Nona's passing? Um, because different people grieve differently. It is a shared um, experience in this instance with the family. Um, so finding out how each one of them is coping would also be important. Um, and along alongside with that to identify whether any additional support might be required for those family members as well. Um, in the context of um, helping Carleen to, to manage her school attendance difficulties, to find out what capacity um, mom or dad um, or even um, her older sister might have to support Carleen in re-engaging the school is, of course, um, something to, to look into as well. Next slide, please. 
When we move into the school level, um, you know, um, as I mentioned briefly, but kind of what school level factors are there? Um, connection with school, whether it's specific teachers, specific peers, um, and friendships um, that that um, are actually really protective for her that, that we could try to engage her in um, and, and motivate her to consider actually going back to school, whether it's even for a couple of um, subjects or a couple of um, curricular or core curricular curricular activities um, to consider whether any risk or maintenance factors, you know, whether there are certain challenges at school that she um, she's also facing, which then becomes an ad additional disincentive for her to consider going back um, to identify those could be would be really important as well and to work with relevant people in the school to help address some of those factors. Um, in terms of the parents on um, work arrangements, more broadly speaking, um, it sounds like that has long hours away from home for work and mom has shift work um, kind of responsibilities, which could potentially have um, limit their capacity or flexibility um, in terms of being there with Colleen if she's not attending school. So that would be, um, it could potentially be an additional stressor um, to um, that the parent, the family would face that you would want to work with them to address as well, um, including um, the potential impact impacts of, of the um, ongoing um, school attendance difficulties on the parents' own employment and financial situation. Um, and then finally, um, just it sounds like they live in a rural or regional location where we know that there could be limited access to supports and services. So trying to identify those that are actually available um, wherever possible, um, you know, whether um, some of this could be remotely accessible, um, such as online um, and, and telehealth type services could be something to explore for, these fam for this family as well. We just skip forward to um, the couple of slides ahead, please. Um, next slide. The next slide. Um, so just touching on um, currently available um, um, resources, um, there is the Partners in Parenting Education or PIP Ed program that um, my team has developed um, in collaboration with Deakin University. Um, so this program is currently freely available um, across Australia to all parents of adolescents, um, so high school age children. So it's an online program that's based on um, the current research evidence um, and international expert consensus about what parents can do to respond to school attendance difficulties. So um, you're, you're very welcome to recommend this program to to parents that you work with and young people you work with um, where, where you think the parents might benefit. Next slide, please. Um, these, these are just the different module topics that are available in the PIPET program. Sorry, next slide. Um, the Partners in Parenting program more broadly is an um, evidence-based program that we've developed um, over 10 years ago now. Um, so this is currently available via the Headspace website. So um, again, if you have, um, if you work with families where the young person is struggling with their mental health, um, this is a program that's freely accessible via Headspace. Next slide. And finally, we also have parenting, um, parenting guidelines that we've developed, um, which are essentially resources that um, involve translating all the evidence that's currently available about what parents can do to support their child's mental health into actionable um, strategies for parents. So, so there are different sets of guidelines for parents of primary school age children, as well as parents of teenagers. So if you go to the Parenting Strategies website, you can um, access all these guidelines for free as well. And then just the last slide just shows the, the specific guidelines for school refusal. Um, this is also one of the guidelines that's available via the Parenting Strategies website. And I'll just stop there. Thank you. Fantastic. They are some excellent resources that I'm sure we will all be having a good look at. Thank you to our wonderful presenters. Let's move on to our Q&A section. So before we get into it, uh, to ask a question, click the three dots in the bottom right-hand corner of the video panel and click Ask a Question. I'll be keeping an eye on this throughout our question and answer section. Um, and we've also had lots of questions come in before the webinar. So let's get into it, shall we? First of all, um, Hayden has asked, which I think is an excellent question, does anyone on the panel have advice about getting schools to actually implement recommendations or, or make accommodations for their students. You know, sometimes it feels as though we're sitting on one side of the wall and they're sitting on the other and no one's communicating. So, Matthew, I might direct that to you to start off with. 
I the biggest thing I would say here is always aim to build relationships and no matter how small so and with all staff all students and really try and keep it warm I'm very aware teachers are under such duress at the moment that it's really important to factor that in so my two cents is definitely keeping those relationships strong doing a lot of follow-up don't let things drop because the warmer we keep stuff the more familiar people get and then it opens doorways and opportunities for connection. And do you tend to find that the when you engage with schools, they prefer phone calls, email? I mean, obviously every school is different, but... This is, it's a really good question. And I think part of that comes down to organisational aspects. But I think in first instance, if you can actually be face-to-face, -face, that's the most ideal because you can actually see a person, you can do a mental state examination and actually get a sense of what's happening. But in a regional area, it's not always possible. So sometimes we do need to get onto telehealth and there's times even with schools where we can't get on the Wi-Fi. So we will do full psychosocial assessments. They can take it up to an hour and a half, two hours on the phone to really get an understanding. So I'm going to do whatever I can to meet them where I need to. Okay. And uh, Tim, you mentioned you like contacting schools. Fantastic. What, what, how do you tend to do it? Do you ring? Do you email a teacher? What's your strategy? Yeah, I'm probably sitting at the other end because I, I often only have time in my days to send an email. But it's one of those ones where it starts slow, but as you start to connect to the networks of teachers that are working in the same community you work in, you begin to have a bit more of a professional relationship. I have to be very, very careful when I contact schools not to ever lead with what I'd like them to do, but the same things we were talking about at the start, seeking to understand what the experience of the school in this situation is and looking at opportunities to connect and support. And the safest area I've found to explore in just, you know, non-linear email communication with teachers is just what could be our shared focus. What, what is the one area where if we're all aligned, we're going to get the greatest positive impact for a family? Yeah, fantastic. I'm actually going to combine the next two questions. So um, Kim and Shabina, thanks very much for your questions. Uh, first of all, sometimes a child just doesn't really know what the issue is. So can you give us some tips for exploring how to interact with a child or an adolescent if they're not really sure what the issue is? Um, and also Shabina would sort of like to know, you know, if they're not willing to talk to you, what are some tips for getting information out of adolescents and children? I mean, we've all had consults where we ask and all we get back in return is nothing, don't know, not sure, don't want to talk. So I might start with Marie for that. What, what strategies have you got in terms of finding out what the problems actually are and, and getting people to talk? Yeah, I think um, this is where the collaborative approach could be really useful. Um, so it's kind of you're trying to piece together a puzzle here. Um, the young person, you know, if you were to to rely on the young person to put all the puzzle pieces together, you know, it, it wouldn't be surprising that that it would be a challenge. Um, but if you could try to find additional puzzle pieces around them, you know, speaking to their family members, speaking to um, their teachers and, you know, any student well-being um, related staff members at school, um, people that they trust and, you know, um, might share with or, you know, engage with um, at a fairly uh, semi-regular basis, for example, people in their immediate environment. Um, so if you could get some of those pieces um, to start with, I think that would be a great start. Um, of course, with consent, you know, um, where, wherever possible. Um, and, and sometimes just having some of those seeds, you know, that you gather from the people around them um, to then come back to the student. Oh, you know, could it be related to this? Or, you know, has it, does it got something, has it got something to do with that? You know, and, and that kind of helps to cue them as well. And, and um, sometimes even that could hook them to actually, maybe you do understand or you're not judging me about the context of that. And that could help them open up as well. So I think that's a, that's one possible way to do it. Could I jump in? Because Oh, sorry, Tim, go for it. Oh, no, I mean, this is just a passion project for me about how do we translate children's lived experience into brief points of GP contact. I love engaging different senses. Sometimes if kids can't tell me about their experience, I can ask them to draw me a picture. 
And I've had young kids draw a picture of a school environment where the teacher's all warm and there's sunbeams, and but then there's this other student and there's kind of lightning bolts or laser beams and you're like, oh, I think there's something to this. Conversely, I remember a teenager who was famously completely non-communicative in my room, but they loved music. And I said, could you bring me a playlist of songs that tell me about your experience at school? And the first song they loaded was Every Day is Exactly the Same. And I just thought, oh, this is amazing because it's communicating and they feel understood but they're not as daunted by the questions I'm asking them. That's fantastic. I'm going to steal that idea. <laughs> um, I just I might. Had, oh, yeah. Sorry, go for it, Matthew. I just had an interesting thought on this. And one thing that I often do is if a young person comes in and they're genuinely sort of worried about opening up or there's that hesitancy, that's where I start. I actually sort of say to them, you know, I think we need to chuck all this other stuff out for a second, actually talk about what's happening for you and what you might be worried about. You know, are you worried mum and dad might think or say something? Are you worried about other people might perceive things? Getting into their world and understanding that worry, unpacking that usually then starts to give you gateway into everything else that I generally find. So it's just my two cents. Yeah, fantastic. Very good thoughts. All right. Um Wang Seng, and I'm so sorry if I've got your name wrong, has asked an interesting question. How do we disable the enablers, namely the parents? So, Tim, you're smiling at me, so that means you get to go first. Thanks, Nicole. Um, I think maybe this is an antidote to imposter syndrome as a practitioner sometimes. We don't have to know how. We just have to know they're there. We have to all agree that that's what we're trying to work on and we have to I think tease out those hidden strengths that may have been suppressed or confidence has been lost in um, I think one of the very translatable skills of general practice is we take goals and we break them down into smaller more achievable sub goals and sometimes pointing out to people that there might be an Everest that's too daunting for them but how about taking a, a nice stroll in your local park, to use an analogy? What does that look like? How can we move you one step along that spectrum? Uh, Marie or Matthew, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah. So I'm just going to clarify the question, Nicole. Is it to disable the enablers? <laughs> yes. <laughs> enablers how do we parents? disable the enablers? So the parents that obviously, uh, perhaps, how do we say it correctly? Ooh, As in let reinforcing, their children, uh... reinforcing the school avoidance, is that what? Correct. Yeah, yeah. correct. I, I think, um, it, and, and of course that, that does happen. Um, I, I think it's really important um, if you're working with the parents um, to, to be able to build that rapport in the first place, you know, so that you can actually um, broach this topic. Um, I, I, you know, what we do know from from all of our research is that, you know, um, inherently parents would would all would feel a sense of self blame, um, a sense of stigma whenever there's some challenge that their child is facing, whether that's school avoidance or um, mental health challenges or, or anything like that. Um, so, so being um, being empathetic towards that is really quite critical, um, and parents would sense that from a mile away. Uh, so, so I think that's a really important first um, point. Um, and and beyond that, to then be able to broach the topic about you know um, what is it like for them, you know that their child is so anxious about school, um, to find out what it is that um, that triggers their own response um, or you know their their the re repeat of their response, whether that's in kind of accommodating the child's anxiety or, you know, uh, enabling the child or, you know, giving permission to their child to stay at home. Um, because oftentimes that's a much easier way, you know, to to manage or respond to the child's anxiety about going to school. So so I think really being with, um, and I really like um, Matthew's um, analogy about kind of sitting a lot side by side with them, seeing what their perspective is on this, um, because that's, that's the only way you can unpack it with them in a way that they don't feel like you're blaming them, but that you're actually there to empower them to do something different. Um, because ultimately they would share the goal um, 
to to help the child get back to school or to re-engage with their education. So then you'll be able to leverage that if you've already built that um that trust um, and alliance with them. Yeah, it's almost like we're treating the parents and the patient, the child, you know, it's almost two different patients sitting in the same room. Uh, Matthew, um, Shell has asked, and this is an interesting question, what are your thoughts around removing Wi-Fi access, et cetera, if a children doesn't like attending school? So basically making home boring, taking away the stuff that makes home fun. What are your thoughts about that? I think it depends on the child. Because if you've got a child who's actively absconding from home or who's got no concern about leaving and you take the Wi-Fi, that's a problem. Because you take the Wi-Fi, they're going to leave. So I think what this comes down to is, and a lot of research shows this, if we negatively reinforce something, it only works in the short term, but long term, it absolutely falls apart generally. So what I'm going to do again is turning Wi-Fi off, maybe not. A reward system could potentially work, a bit of a graded exposure system. I'm still going to need to understand the problem because I'm going to hazard a guess the Wi-Fi itself isn't the problem itself. It's probably something much more than that. So that's what I'm going for. But as a short-term thing, if they can find it or build it into where this can be really good is later on, once you've understood the problem and actually started to make progress and things have stabilised somewhat, then bringing this in a reward system, that's also where it can be highly useful. So I think it's choosing your time and place, but it also depends what you're looking at. And uh, Marie, I'm, I'm really interested on your thoughts on this as well. Rewards, punishments, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard call as a parent sometimes. Yeah, I, I would agree with what um, Matthew's already said, but um, I, I guess the only, the only other thing I might add is um, whatever approach you are taking, um, it's really important as far as possible to help the child to understand where you're coming from um you know so so I think instead of going like that's it you know you're just enjoying being at home too much I'm going to switch off the wi-fi you know which is punitive um you know to to actually talk with them about what that means or what that looks like so you know what what we know um is recommended um by experts in the field is you know you if the child is staying from staying home from school um what you want to try to do as much as possible is to kind of be to to communicate with them that the the goal here is you know that this is temporary that you're going to start working towards your re-engagement goal you know whatever that might look like in with school um, and in some instances if the child is at a stage where they are they are prepared to engage with that idea even in a in remote sense um you know that you would actually try to structure their day, you know, like a school day, you know, and starting at nine and finishing at three, whatever the school hours are. These are the things that you would try to do and fill your day with, you know, so that it's not like, oh, yeah, great, you know, a uh, whole day I'll just be at home gaming, you know, and, and on, online and so on. Um, so that could be part of that as well, having some structure in the day. So that it's not just, you know, you don't get to go online, but, you know, yes, there's this school hours, you know, there are these things that you do, um, which, which is still expected because we are all in the process as getting you back um, so that it's, it's not reinforcing um, being away from school in that sense. And uh, Phoebe has asked an excellent question. Aside from our standard mood questionnaires that I'm sure we all use, are there any questionnaires more specific to school refusal that are useful? And in particular, are there some that are different for primary school? Is it worth using the narrative approach for primary school kids? And is it different to the questions that you would ask an adolescent? So, Tim, I might start with you if that's okay. There's two that I sometimes use in my clinical practice. The most common one I will use is the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, which is a very balanced assessment, not a diagnostic assessment in any way, but quite useful sometimes in terms of a severity of impact measure of the different facets of a child's life and a really good way of uh, interrogating for hidden strengths as well and, and changing the narrative that you explore with the family. In some of my younger kids too, I will use the SCARED questionnaire, which is a specific questionnaire for anxiety and worry, but breaks it down into subsets, um, including um, separation fear from parents, social fear, general fear, all sorts of different things. And it, 
again, I, I'm not using it to know where to start. I'm much more interested in using it in terms of this is a tool that perhaps captures some of that information that's flowing in the consultations. Uh, Marie, do you have any other suggestions? I think they're both fantastic, Tim. I've written them both down. But Marie, have you got any other ones you'd like to mention? Yeah, so SCAD is um, one that I was going to mention. I, I think they have a school um, school related anxiety subscale as well. So, so if that's something that you're particularly interested in, you can look into that. Um, there's a less widely known one because it's I think it's still fairly new. It's I think it's called school refusal evaluation questionnaire. So it, it kind of touches on different domains, so kind of behavioral, cognitive, emotional um, aspects of school avoidance. So, so if you're trying Trying to get a better understanding of what it is or whether there are specific as aspects um, of school um, that the, the child is um, struggling most with, um, that could be um, a, a useful tool to look into as well. Thank you for that. Now, um, Matthew, I'm going to delve into the homeschooling side of things. So lots and lots of questions have come through about homeschooling, the merits of it. At what point do we you know, agree that, yes, homeschooling is going to be a big thing. Are we actually making the problem worse? Because, you know, if they're not interacting with the school environment and we're homeschooling, we're just prolonging the problem. So I'm, I'm interested to hear everybody's thoughts. But, Matthew, I'm going to uh, start with you. I think it's a really interesting question. And, again, I'm going to come back to it depends on the context. But I do think that recently we have seen a big increase in homeschooling. And there are absolutely times where there are situations where young people are being homeschooled where it may not be appropriate. So I think it comes down to them working very closely with the school as much as possible, as well as the parent and young person to really accurately assess that. But in terms of homeschooling in general, that's where then I sort of think you then need that bigger biopsychosocial assessment to factor, is this something that's an appropriate fit? Someone has really chronic illness or they've got immunocompromisation yeah, quite likely. But what we also see elsewhere with the homeschool side is that we can get young people who can really, really push for that. And then it may not always be the right fit, but then parents can also have stuff going on that makes it easier. Or you could live in a rural area where it's really hard to access school. Parents start work early, finish late. It's it's really, really difficult. So I think these all need to be factored in before a real decision is made on that one. But you also can't be doing it in a place where it's reinforcing avoidance. And uh, Tim, I might jump to you next. Thanks. There's an analogy that's helpful to consider, which is, you know, the, the, the creature trapped in the, the pot of boiling oil. They just want to get out of it. And school refusal can feel like that. And the temptation can be sometimes to see bringing your child into a very familiar home environment as the absolute kindest thing you can do. And to, in many ways, it is. What I think is really important to bring into early discussions with a child and family is that idea of long-term goals. Because a, a child may have some very clear visions of where they want their preferred future to be. And if those uh, goals cannot be obtained in the homeschool environment with the resources and skill sets that family has available, then it can only form a very small part of that child's overall journey. And so taking that long-term view early on is really key. There's another question in all of this that comes up and we see it discussed in the mainstream media a lot too, which is that idea of how do we foster resilience and how do we learn out of our approach to situations that were overwhelming and difficult about ourselves. And again, this is not something I seek to direct, but it's definitely a touch point I want to keep returning to with families about just what are we trying to teach, but also what does this child most benefit from learning and are they synced up? And uh, Marie, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I'll just quickly add to that. Um, one, one key point really is just um, looking at the 
how how well equipped and and the capacity of the family to support homeschooling, um, both as a short and a longer term um, kind of arrangement. Um, so in addition to you know the avoidance, you know reinforcing the avoidance and so on, um, it's also thinking about um, the other aspects of school that you know um, a, a school a structured school environment um, that. The young person will be missing out on and how else um, the homeschool arrangement will try to cater to those needs as well you know including you know peer relationships and social skills and so on um, which we know are of course you know central to to a child and young person's development um, so so it's there's there's a lot that the essentially the family is taking on if they if they go towards a homeschooling arrangement and and actually working through the, the the reality and the implications of that with family, I think it's really important um, because what does happen is some families think that it is an easy way out um, until until it hits them, you know, the reality of what it really involves. And I guess following on from that, other people have asked about changing schools, you know, if a child keeps saying, oh, I'm not going to school, but I'll go if I change schools, you know, coming back to resilience, uh, it's it's a hard question, but any thoughts from the panel about at what point do we say, all right, maybe we just need to change schools? I might jump in and say that it's a, to me it's a never say never and a never say always. Um, but again, I see it not as a first line intervention really for the situation, because it's not just in terms of what might benefit that child. There's no argument that sometimes situations can get pretty toxic and a change seems really appealing. But it is that idea of translatable skills. How are you going to be equipped to the level that if those changes are made and then the situation recurs, which is what the evidence tells us, problems have legs, um, how are you going to approach it then? And maybe it's easier down here because it's, it's small enough that people run out of opportunities to change after a little while and they're pretty accepting of that. All right. Um, I'm going to move on to an area where a lot of questions have come through and that's moving on to ASD um, and pathological avoidance. Now, I just want to highlight there will be a webinar on neurodiversity in June. So I highly recommend everyone tunes in for that as well. But given there's a huge amount of questions coming through, I think we should touch on that. So oh, there's a lot to say. Maria, I might start with you. So well, Anthea has asked the PIP ed program that you mentioned says it's not tailored for people with ASD. So I'm going to start this discussion by are there specific resources for parents whose children have a disability in the school refusal space? The short answer to that is I'm not aware of these um, in terms of an actual kind of parenting program um, as such. Um, the, the, the PIP ed program as um as uh, this audience member has, has identified um, is, yeah, we, we do put that disclaimer up um, because we are aware that there are some specific needs that um, our program really is not designed to cater for in, in its current form. Um, that is something that we're certainly looking into addressing better um, in, in the next iteration. Um, but um, I, I think the, the program could still be usable um, by, by parents who, um, have the ability or feel like they have the ability to to tailor the strategies to their their child's needs um in the context of their the neurodiversity um which for some parents that's actually something that they would just do quite readily anyway um we certainly have had had families who have used our program and and were able to still apply a lot of the strategies or in, in an adapted form um, and, and still find them useful. So um so yeah that's that's probably um as, as good as it gets at this point. And uh, just in general, can you before I move to Tim and Matthew, ASD, school refusal do you have any specific comments you want to sort of make in that space, in particular strategies that can be really useful for, for working with neurodiverse children in, this, in, in terms of getting them back to school? Yeah, I, I think um, one, one thing that has come up a lot in the work we've done with families um, is to actually help the, 
the family to um, best understand what it is about their child's neurodiversity um, that could be related to their school attendance difficulties. Um, so kind of understanding that part of the picture for the child, um, because in some instances it is right smack that's central to it. You know, it's, it's all around, you know, they, they're not feeling like they belong. They are struggling to, to keep up with the work. You know, it's all related to, to the, the challenges inherent in their um, neurodiverse condition. But in other instances, it's actually quite peripheral. It's, you know, a specific incident that was, you know, um, had nothing to do with their ASD, for example. Um, so, so I think not making those assumptions um, is, is important, but to actually try to understand the picture again for that specific individual and for that family. Um, I think the other thing that has come up is, you know, for some families, it is still a query. So it's kind of like, oh, you know, they, they're having trouble, you know, or they're feeling anxious about attending school. So they're, they're, they're stopping. But um, it's, it was raised that maybe they have a learning difficulty or maybe, you know, it's related to um, ADHD or, you know, like, but it's not been diagnosed. Um, so, so for some families, it was never even in the radar. And when the school attendance difficulties surface, that's when it becomes a query. And for some, for some of these families, it's like, if only someone had told us this earlier, you know, like, or pointed us in the right direction to get an assessment, to get an evaluation, you know, and then to better understand what is happening or has been happening for our child in the past eight years of their schooling, you know. So, so I think wherever possible to, um, to su support the family, if there are any concerns in, in that direction, to get the appropriate assessments and evaluation so that they can then better understand their child's needs earlier on. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good perspective on things. Uh, Matthew, would you like to to comment on the ASD neurodiversity in terms of school refusal? Yeah, and I think there's actually so many factors in this. So I, I definitely don't think we can cover it all, but I think one of the big things that we need to factor in is the other factors beyond us, which is things like working with an OT and sensory profiling, making sure additional testing has been done to rule out other comorbid diagnosis, and also looking at um, environment, the environment, because the environment actually plays a big role with um, things like sensory overload, um, too much social stimulation can cause shut off and um, executive dysfunction. So I think with ASD, again, coming in, working as much as you can as a multidisciplinary team, very much staying in your own lane, but trying to bring all the pieces of the puzzle together as a whole with the school is like the best way to try and reintegrate but also other things recently trying to get um people connected with out of school social groups like um headspace does and other youth organizations offer a number of different groups that might have asd specific or neurodivergent specific where there's that ability to just click with peers so i think as well just broadening this outside of the school is also really important because you can then translate those skills later on into school. It's a lot less formal and intimidating at times. So I think you really need to be thinking holistic, big picture, whole life here and tackle that as a big systemic approach. Yeah, some, some great thoughts there. And Tim, what do, what do you want to say about this topic? Well, like all areas that are really important, there are so many different perspectives and opinions and, and all of them have value. I think one of the areas I, I really like to engage with families as the advocates for their child over is that idea of this spectrum of what are we doing to support your child? Because at the polls you will see schools of thought that say we have to uh, equip our children with neurodiversity with skills to enable them to deal with a pretty rough world. And at the other pole, you'll see we need to adapt our world to embrace these children. And I think like all poles, to me, the truth will tend to lie somewhere in that spectrum in between. But it has to be individualised to each specific situation and each specific person. I have a colleague who is quite renowned for saying, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism, you know, but when you start to talk about it and when you start to engage with people over it, you do see uh, these blanket structures and rules being applied and sometimes just exploring what's actually already happening 
I've got a lovely anecdote of a child I'm currently seeing who has an ADHD diagnosis and is a beautiful contributor to their classroom. And when their diagnosis was reached, we did engage with the teachers over what's that going to mean practically for you in the classroom? And the teacher came back with, well, I'm going to give them more chances to sit on the mat rather than less. And we just had to filter that through. This isn't a child who benefits necessarily from more chances to get it wrong. They benefit from earlier support in helping you and getting it right and getting that positive praise and engagement. But that teacher was just honestly doing the best job that they thought they could for the child. And as the health professionals, with a little bit of the knowledge, not just of the label, but of the child, we are sometimes very well placed to navigate that whole well in the in the micro and in the meta. What are we actually doing with these labels and things that we are using to describe this person? Yeah, some wonderful thoughts there. Uh, a question's come in from Sandeep, which I think is a fantastic question. From a teacher's perspective, how should, you know, are there any tips for teachers about orientation of a classroom, classroom setup, things on the walls, et cetera, so that kids feel validated in their early years and particularly primary school, early high school, so that we can work more as a proactive way to reducing um, school refusal? Marie, I might start with you. Sorry, now I can't find mute, a mute button. Um, I think that's a, that's a, a, it's a very beautiful question. Um, I think the this my first response is um, take time to understand each child, to to engage with each child, um, and to be prepared to embrace a whole range of preferences and, and needs and, you know, inclinations. Um, I think being tuned in to that range is probably a, a really good place to start um, so that, you know, not operating by assumptions, um, but you are actually um, have creating opportunities to cater to different um, different students' um, learning preferences and styles um, and also respond to um, needs that do still arise in the context of your best efforts. Um, so it's, I think it's... Um, I think that there is certainly value in, in um, teaching staff, um, staff um, having that awareness and that, that preparedness to... Um, allow for variations in the approach um, because there's the appreciation that students learn differently and engage with different approaches um, differently and have different preferences. Um, and, and in doing so, um, the students then feel like, you know, there is something for them as well, but, you know, and, and not just, you know, only for the kids who are able to sit on the mat quietly or only for the kids who are able to hand in their work, um, you know, with beautiful neat handwriting, but, you know, to actually um, feel valued for their in unique strengths as well. Um, and just in the interest of time, Marie, I'm going to stick with you. Uh, Kirsten has asked, can you comment on the research that is often cited that we need to work really hard to get kids back to school in the first two weeks of school refusal? Is it actually true? Is there evidence that the quicker we get them back in there, the more likely we are to be successful? Well, I think um, there, the, the short answer is there's still very little research on school refusal, um, whether that's in terms of the, the causal factors, um, you know, like in terms of experimental designs that say this is definitely a cause of, um, a lot of the evidence is correlational. So this is associ associated with school refusal. Um, so that's one thing. But in terms of responses, um, I think generally speaking, um, there, there is the, the belief that, you know, earlier intervention, you know, kind of nipping in and about um, kind of approach um, has benefits because it reduces the, the kind of compounding impacts of some of these um, 
um, behaviors or symptoms of, you know, um, whether that's like mental health related or, or school refusal, because as you, you can imagine, the longer a child has, or the more days of school the child has missed, um, the more impacts they could experience both, you know, socially, academically, you know, in terms of the anxiety building up, because it's like now they have missed a whole term of school or they, they, they fall behind their work or their friends have moved on, you know, like it's, there are all these things that students would then miss out on and then feel more anxious about. So, so I think just from that perspective, um, there, there is value um, in terms of trying to intervene earlier, um, but it's also important to acknowledge that not all students and all families would be prepared to have that, you know, let's go cold turkey, let's just bring the child back into school after they've missed like, you know, three weeks of school, you know, straight. Um, so, so I think that's really important to keep in context and, and the approach or the solution that you work towards has to be contextualized to what the understanding of the child's reasons for missing school is in the, in the first instance. And uh, Matthew, Karen has asked, how do you approach school refusal when adolescents are using substances at home whilst their parents are at work when they should be at school? What are your thoughts? This is a really multi-pronged question. Firstly, it's going to depend on what your current child protection laws are. And I think that's going to vary with your state. So that's the first thing you're going to need to look at is looking at what it constitutes as being a mandatory reporter. Um, I also think it's, this is why it's also really imperative with the outset of any form of treatment that we are actually going through the limitations of what consent is and confidentiality is in this context so it doesn't trip you up later in the therapy relationship. From there, though, I'm not going to jump the gun or go into that. I'm going to really try and get an understanding and be talking with a parent. I'm going to be trying talking with young person. I'm risk assessing. I'm I'm doing all this stuff first just to make sure stabilization and risk is assessed and managed as much as possible. Then I'm going to start getting into the nitty gritty a bit more. I'm going to start asking questions that are going around into this. And also then looking at the level of severity, how long has this been going on, contributing factors, trauma, grief, loss, is social isolation. So there's so many things that need to be factored and then linking with other services, supporting, I just go from there. But it really starts with that risk assessment, the mandatory reporting laws. But then once we've got through that, I want to back off that a little bit and then focus on the young person, the family to really understand how I can support them. Um, also working with a school with that one and the wider systems is imperative quite often as well because it's not often just school that's being affected. A lot of the stuff's usually falling off and being affected at this point in other areas of life. Yes, uh, definitely a, a complicated a complicated area, that's for sure, and I guess that's absolutely where your multidisciplinary team has to come into play. Uh, Tim, a question from Amanda. How do we make parents feel safe that sending their child to school, even if they really don't want to go, is you know, is okay. Um, how do we take away the guilt about parenting and, and how do we address the fact that parents are worried that the school is judging them about the way their kids are acting? Mm, yes, parental guilt is a powerful, powerful tool for many, many things. I find it most helpful from where I'm sitting to uh, explore when I have that safe time with the parents their own experience of being a child. And most parents I'm with can recount those stories of not wanting to get up, not wanting to get out of bed, not wanting to get on the bus, got the mean teacher today, but they pushed through, they found something there, and maybe that was the time when they, you know, the parents surprised them by taking them out for a hot chocolate after school or they met the person who would become their best friend. And they just see it in a broader context that being the friend to your child is a different to being the parent to your child. And neither are easy jobs, but at the end of the day, being the best parent to them, you won't always feel like their best friend, and that's okay. Yes, uh, very good advice for all of us who are parents, I think. Um, and finally, before we start to wrap things up, uh, Marie, this is a loaded question, so I'm not expecting a thesis, but 
A few people have asked about complex trauma. So uh, Chanel in particular has asked if someone's in a, a complex trauma situation, domestic violence, et cetera, are there specific strategies we should be thinking about with those children and adolescents? So we're talking about school attendance difficulties in the context of the child having experienced or being exposed to um, trauma or having experienced complex trauma. Correct, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, uh, it sounds like something that is in uh, in Matthew's um, um, realm of expertise, but uh, my brief comment would be um, to... to try to address that and, and understand the role of that as much as possible um, in the in the presentation of you know school refusal. Um, it, if there is if, if it's identified that there's complex trauma involved, um, I would I would focus on addressing that um, more than you know we just need to get you back to school. You know um, I'm sorry to hear that you've had you know these traumatic experiences. Um, so so the safety is is going to be um, paramount um, in a current safety obviously um, and and any other safety concerns um, and um, the the need. Um, for, for addressing the complex trauma um, that's actually been um, revealed in this instance um, would take priority, I would say, over try just getting them back at school. And Matthew, yeah, I'd love your perspective as well. I think a really important comment with complex trauma is to factor in that if trauma comes up, being very mindful of your position with that young person because if you're not a trauma therapist, you can be opening Pandora's box sometimes. So being really sensitive for your own self-care and the young person's self-care. If things start to go into too much detail, just really gently controlling the conversation and go, look, I'm not a qualified therapist, but it's really important that we do understand this is a really important part. But I also then, I agree with what Marie said, what I think I'm going to then do if you're in the therapy sort of space with this in the therapy space is actually starting to look at the, what, how the, the trauma has got them to there today and led to avoidance behaviours. And I'm going to further unpack that and help that to help understanding as a trauma therapist over this side. But then I think over this side, you need other systems and supports in place in the social group with teachers, um, with the parents, because complex trauma is a ripple effect across the whole family system generally, and even sometimes a school system. Um, so this is where I think then you want to bring all them in and you've got to look at where, what your position in their life is and what you can and can't do in that. So we all play a, such an important role in this one though with complex trauma, but I really think it's about validating what they've been through wasn't okay and was really, really, really horrible. But we also then need to start getting life back on track because we get stuck. Traumas really really you know unfortunate that it can get us stuck so I want to help understand how do we get unstuck and then working with everyone to start working towards that and baby steps do not the major thing here is not to rush thanks for all of your fantastic advice uh tonight to our presenters I'm going to get you to give a two minute little sum up what's what's your main take-home message from tonight so Tim I'll start with you Oh, I get the easy one if I'm going first. Um, the biggest thing that struck me listening to the questions and listening to the responses is that collaboration is key. The more we can unify the world of support around a, a, a child and their family, and the more we can keep the goals focused on what actually most benefits, not just the short but the medium and long term of that child's trajectory through life, that's going to be positive, therapeutic, useful. And if we're ever getting stuck or lost, I think that's where we need to come back to as well, to just recenter around, hang on, where were we pointing and are we still pointing that way? Uh, Matthew. Really listen, really ask questions and get curious about everything like even little tiny things that happen in session like i even you know if someone even makes a comment around they looked at me this way oh tell me a bit more about that i think the big big takeaway as well is 
make we're all doing amazing jobs and we all do different things but we all play such a key part in that and to never underestimate that and also sometimes ourselves taking the back seat and being curious and patience versus going in with an agenda because I think sometimes with school stuff even I'm um, a victim for this where I go in with an agenda and it's absolutely not where the young person is and I need to review myself so really important and critically self-reflective practice I think so key to this too. And Marie? Yeah I think two key takeaways I would highlight is um, again remember to to look for that complete picture or try to complete the picture as much as possible with every young person that you work with um, and kind of thinking about you know as I mentioned the student level family level school level community level um, factors to to best understand what is happening and and um, to identify in that process which is my second takeaway is um, what key um, protective factors and strengths can you leverage in this in this work that you're going to do um, because it's so easy in the context of something like school refusal to just see the problem um, you know it's so uh, the child is not going to school, they want to go, the family wants them to go to school, the school wants them back, you know, this, there's just so much that can be, you know, it, it can overhaul the, you know, or distract from the focus that this is an individual here, you know, they have strengths, they have interests, um, they have a future, you know, and, and you have um, an opportunity here to, to help them tap into that, to see past the cloud and the haze of the current challenges and, and the, the complete picture that you try to, that you help them to put together in the process of working with them um, is, is a really important part of, um, of helping them to, to reach their end goal with um, addressing this problem and, and the strengths there to leverage um, in themselves and the people around them. Yeah, some, some excellent thoughts to, to finish. Look, I'd really like to thank our panellists tonight. You've all been absolutely wonderful. Your thoughts, your insights, I've learned a huge amount and I'm sure everybody else has as well. Uh, thank you to all of the wonderful questions that came through. Thank you for being brave and asking. Now, I am going to ask people to complete the exit survey and provide feedback on this webinar. Uh, so you should be able to see on your screen, uh, a banner link to that or a QR code, which will enable you to complete the survey. Also, this webinar has been recorded and you will receive follow-up communication with the recording via email shortly. Now, there are some excellent other webinars coming up. So on the 17th of April, we have working alongside Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in out-of-home care through a culturally safe framework. And uh, on the 26th of June, a webinar which I suspect will be very popular, Supporting the Mental Health of a Neurodivergent Person with Co-Occurring Autism and ADHD. So I think there'll be a lot to learn for all of us from that webinar. And finally tonight, I would like to acknowledge lived experience that people and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thanks to everybody for participating tonight and have a good evening.